I guess we start from the top then since none, okay. <laughs> none of that went through. <laughs> I'll just speed through everything. Yeah. Uh, we went to school together. We both got bachelor's in ecology. You went a little bit more into like the medical uh, route. I stayed in ecology. I worked as a zookeeper for a little bit. I love educating. I love animals, but mostly bugs. Uh, I think that was it. <laughs> yep. And uh, all this, school. all of this is based on uh, research that we did not do. So you will have access to that at the end of this. And we'll also, so we'll kind of talk about mosquitoes, uh, their importance, why they make us itch, and open it up to questions at the end. Oh my gosh, I had a comment and now I don't have it anymore. Oh well. <laughs> so, um, is this my slide? Yes, the green one. Okay. Yours. Oh gosh. Oh, okay, okay. I didn't go through the anatomy too much, so this is based off just what I know in general. Um, so there are, I think, like I think I said, four thousand species of mosquito in several genuses. So for anyone who doesn't know, a genus is like, um. So you have like your kingdom, like animals, and then it breaks up into more specific um, areas like our arthropods, our mammals, our reptiles, things like that. And then you go a little bit more detailed. So there's several genera is how you say like the plural of genus um, of mosquitoes. And only I think they said only four genera out of however many there are, are actually capable of like... Um, passing disease to uh other animals i think that's what it said yes i remember Let me, before we continue i want to just look up the paper real quick so i can have it on the oh, side sure. i think that would be really good to be able to go back to and go back up okay so this oh my god it is it's culex anopheles and Aedes are the the genuses that are responsible for um passing on certain viruses so you don't have, you don't even have to worry about all mosquitoes um and like them getting you sick or anything like that um okay so there's 3500 species in 42 genera and it's three of them oh i was totally wrong it's three of them that only cause human bites and uh. then out of those uh genera are only certain species can actually like pass on diseases um so there's really not that much to worry about depending on where you're located and if all mosquitoes can actually like get you sick or anything like that um they are insects which means they have three pairs of legs so they have six legs total um and in this um group they also have two pairs of wings which you can't really see it it only looks like there's only one pair of wings in this photo um but they do have two pairs um as larvae, they usually uh, their their eggs are laid in water, and they kind of float and sit at the surface and kind of eat from there until they like transition into like adult mosquitoes, which is why you usually see an influx of mosquitoes near water, like standing water. That's why people like the invention of standing water, like back in like caveman days, like we used to have rivers and streams. And you didn't really see that many mosquitoes, but as soon as we started farming and like storing water and we had standing water in like lakes and streams and reservoirs and things like that, they, I think that's what kind of uh, pushed for the influx of mosquito um, diversity and just kind of resulted in them kind of taking over the world. <laughs> um, they... So a lot of people, I think, don't think know this, but mosquitoes are, it's only the females that are capable of biting humans. So, mm -hmm. um, and that's to uh, suck up blood from their host. So like a human, and that's actually used to help feed and produce their eggs. So you don't even have to worry about male mosquitoes, but I actually don't know if it's easy to tell the difference between a male and female just by looking yeah, at them. Yeah, I don't know. because So the, the males are... Or is it across the board they're all fruit eaters or is oh that... that's a good question i i feel like that's pretty accurate um i can't say for sure though but that makes sense if they're not hunting for blood they're eating they have the same mouth parts though so i mean else. i imagine unless there's a, a significant size difference because i don't ever remember differentiating males and females in class yeah i don't remember um but yeah, in, in terms of uh, this paper and like itching and like the yeah, response to humans, it's females, mostly females. Female mosquitoes yeah. of about three uh, genera. Yeah, exactly. Um, and on the right side, you'll see uh, kind of a close up of 
the mouth parts of the mosquito, um, I think this would be relevant to only females then. Um, so they actually have six different parts that make up their entire proboscis, and they're all responsible for doing different things. I didn't look up to see what each one is responsible, so this is just based off what I know. Um, so some of them, like there's, uh, I think probably the labrum is probably used to actually like poke through the skin because it actually looks quite, quite sharp at the end. So to puncture the skin, and then there are some parts that will actually um, introduce saliva into the wound and that can stop uh, the blood that they're picking up from uh, um, coagulating so they can actually keep sucking it up and it's not going to like harden or anything like that mm -hmm. and um yeah go ahead oh don't they also introduce a uh an anesthetic that prevents the oh wait no sorry yes. <laughs> am i thinking of a different insect no no i think you're right because um i think they well, it could be that, or it could be, as we'll talk about later, how whatever they do introduce, I, I think it actually yeah, it is in the saliva. Exactly. It doesn't, it, it doesn't interact with the body to like trigger an immune response immediately, because if you like got bit by a mosquito and it started sucking up blood and you felt it as it's happening, you're going to pay attention to that mosquito and right. try to swipe it or smack it away. And then they're not going to be able to collect blood. So it's a, it's a delayed response, um, at least from that aspect. And I think that comes from the saliva. Yes. Um, I think through that same mouth part is where they can also uh, put back blood because that's how the transmission of disease takes place. They've, they've taken up blood from a diseased host. They go to another host and then they input some of that blood and also the disease. So I don't know which part of the of the proboscis does that, but that is a thing that happens. Um, and then there's another part. I think it's probably the labella that actually sucks up blood, and that's what they'll use to feed their eggs. So it's actually it's an intentional. Pro I thought it was backwashing, basically, that they transmitted that it wasn't. So they're they're actually ejecting some blood that they didn't need anymore, like waste product. I don't know if it's that they don't need it. I think backsplash is a, a more relevant. Um, way to describe it yeah i don't think it's that they're getting rid of blood they don't need i think it's kind of like just some blood gets filtered back through like maybe with the saliva that they're putting in i don't actually know um like the steps of of the transmission um all i know is there is blood transfer yeah, and that's yeah. what causes the disease <laughs> like we said there's like 3500 different species so you're going to see a lot of variation in the size of mosquitoes, kind of the coloration, where they're found, um, things like that. And then, like I was saying, with the different uh, genera, only certain genuses can actually um, bite humans, A, or bite people, animals, A, and B, um, pass on disease. So, Which kind of leaves maybe an interesting question is, is, since there's so many mosquitoes that are not relevant to biting us, uh, do people even notice those? Or do they say, oh, that's a fly, or that's a, a gnat or something? Or does yeah. it, it depends on how prevalent the biting ones are. So if they're being bit more and then they see the non-biting ones, they go, oh my God, look at all of them. But it's just a, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, that's true. I think there's a lot that we don't know. And it's mosquitoes, like, yes, there's going to be variation, but for the most part, they're going to have similar uh, anatomy. So I think in general, people are just like, oh, that's a mosquito. Like they think crane flies or mosquitoes that's or like true. you were saying, certain other flies. So I think that there's a lot of um, just a lack of knowledge and in, in being able to identify what actually is a mosquito and like any bug that flies on them, they think is a mosquito and they'll smack it away. Yeah. Um, so a lot of people think that like, like, oh, why, why do mosquitoes have to exist? Like, why, what is the purpose of a mosquito? Like they, all they do is spread disease. They're responsible for killing millions of people a year or causing disease in millions of people a year. Um, what is the point of them? And I think that's it's understandable to have that uh, opinion, but I think it's grossly, um, misinformed um so in general mosquitoes play a really big part on the ecology and um kind of networking between other species so probably the biggest thing about mosquitoes is they actually are very very um important pollinators for plants so if you, on the right side i have a picture of a mosquito that's actually sitting in the pollen you can see all the pollen on its legs so they are really important for for 
plant life in general. Um, they're also a food source for an abundant number of species, both as their larval form and as their adult form. So as the larval form, like I said, they, they tend to live in water. They usually like float on the surface. So during that time, they're a great food source for uh, birds that hang out near water, uh, fish, frogs, dragonfly nymphs that are actually um, carnivorous as well and also tend to live near the water. So super important for that. And then as adults, they're incredibly important for bats, other birds, um, spiders, dragonflies, anything else that tends to eat insects and can catch things that are flying. Um, so super important as a food source. And I want to say that there's a certain, I think it's a certain uh, bat or a bird that like exclusively hunts mosquitoes. And like that is like their prime food source. So without mosquitoes, that species would likely no longer exist. Um, and then the other thing is, uh, I think it's possums that are the ones that like eat ticks a lot, but I imagine that like, they're so heavy into eating insects that they're also very crucial, oh, yeah. um, biologic control for, for mosquitoes. So they're important to many, many animals and plants in the ecosystem. And then, like I was saying before, the spread of disease to humans and animals, obviously that's not a great thing to have but yeah. it is something that we have and it's kind of a, a a form of of not natural selection but just population control depending on what species you're looking at um like i was saying only certain species of mosquito can actually pass on diseases like malaria west nile dengue fever zika um and they're only found in certain areas so it's not like you have to worry about a mosquito wherever you go and the, um go ahead oh the uh there's the, all those uh, efforts at trying to breed those out of the population, the, these diseases. I don't know how effective any of those are. Do you know? Uh, I don't know how effective it is. I know they've been doing a lot, um, especially recently, a lot more research um, and experiments with like um, sterilizing mosquitoes. And I want to say they're sterilizing male mosquitoes. So what they'll do is they'll have a, a population of, of male mosquitoes, sterilize them, and then, or they bred the sterilization. I don't know the process that they're doing. But with those sterilized males, the females will try to mate with them, think they mated successfully, lo and behold, they can't actually produce eggs. So it kind of stops that population from expanding. Um, They've done that. I know they've done like robotic mosquitoes so that like oh, yeah. the females think they're breeding with with a live mosquito and it's absolutely not. So there's a lot of research going into like ways to control mosquito populations and thus control like, um, excuse me, control the diseases that are getting passed. Um, here's a, oh, um, this is actually on the left side is an example of uh, a fish. It's called the mosquito fish and they're, they're, this fish is like exclusively um, a predator of mosquitoes. So things like these are really, really important for the ecosystem and like managing those populations. So we're going to talk about reactions to mosquito bites. Uh, there's a lot of information. I'll try and condense it down and not uh, get carried away. We all know they give us these little itchy bumps. You can call them wheels or papules. They're kind of differentiated a little bit in that wheels are uh, an immediate reaction. They come with some redness around them. It typically peaks in about half an hour. They can come with a very large localized reaction. And those can be, those. the onset of that will be in minutes to hours. And the people who have those may be diagnosed with a mosquito allergy. but Papules, on the other hand, are the little bumps. They take longer to appear, about a day or two, and they're all about the same size as each other. These little bumps. But whether can I they're... Have you go oh, back sorry, go to okay. Can I have you go back to like the wheel slide? Yeah. Um, and where that large bump is, it's like blue in there. Do you know what that blue refers to? Is it like the saliva that's getting in there? I believe. Or just like a build -up? I believe that should just uh, that should be lymph as well as uh, just what do you call the cellular fluid? The okay. I, it was not specific. Yeah, a lot of these pictures are not specific. I could look into that, but I believe that's. It's mostly inflammation, I think. It's so it's, it's lymph okay. and and just other assorted cellular fluid. 
the, gotcha. I kind of pro I probably should have talked about uh, the process of inflammation because that's inflammation is an important process, even though it bothers us. Mm -hmm. uh, it does allow it is part of the immune process. It it allows for things to be attacked and treated. But when uh, inflammation goes unchecked, if it just it's inflamed forever, that's when mm -hmm. you start getting breakdown because now that um, the passageway to all your cells have been opened up, they're not existing in their normal function. They're they're too open, and you start getting cell death. Gotcha. Okay. So yeah. So the important thing is is the inflammation part, kind of coming back to. Reactions, yeah, is right? it, you've got you've got two kinds of, of little bumps. Uh, these are just different names for what you've got, but most people just see I've got a bump. I got a mosquito bite. It's itchy. I don't like it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and in time, they both disappear. Do you know if oh. if you to not be uh, not get itchy from a mosquito bite, would the skin around that area still turn red, or is the redness a result of us reacting and itching it? Sorry, could you repeat that? Yeah, yeah. If if I don't know if you know, but if you manage to ignore a mosquito bite, and I know how difficult that really <laughs> is, <laughs> do you think that the skin around the the bite would still turn red? Oh yeah. Or is so, the redness yeah. just a result of you itching it or scratching it? Okay, so yeah, there definitely would still be a redness. Part of the okay. inflammatory process, uh, it's the redness has a fancy medical term, erythema, uh, but it, it is it just means redness in I believe Latin, Latin or Greek. It's always Latin or Greek. Uh, and <laughs> the redness, if I recall, it has to do with blood flow. Um, you can, of course, make the redness worse by scratching at it, but there were, there's often, when you examine somebody for redness as a sign of an infection, um, mm -hmm. so uh, if somebody had uh, a surgery uh, and you're checking the stitches and there's redness, well, they probably weren't touching it, but it's, it's the, the tissue is inflamed is what it is. It's inflammation. It's just inflamed. Okay. Yeah, it's because yeah. blood flow, blood goes yeah. to that site and that's causing the inflammation. Yeah. Okay. It's a, it's a byproduct of inflammation. Okay. Um, I, I, on the slide before this one, where you just have a giant meme, um, <laughs> yeah. I had some, notes. I wanted to chime oh. in on the itching. Yeah. Did you need Which it? I love. I love this that video. For that hey, I added a sound and I realized there was additional sound I didn't mean to have in there. Oh, no. Uh, okay. Yeah, so, but it's... Oh. Anyway. Um, okay, so uh, Ivy was wondering why they, mosquitoes tend to bite some people more than others. Um, in the paper, they do talk about how there's a strong, a suggested strong genetic association to bite susceptibility. And they did, they showed, showed this via um, identical versus fraternal twins. Um, so there does seem to be a little bit of a correlation where your genes will determine if you are more susceptible to being bit or not. Um, and they're thinking that maybe it's due to um, similar body odors or temperature or just pheromones things that like genetically you might be more similar to like um a sibling with versus like a complete stranger um and i we didn't talk about it before but in terms of how mosquitoes find a potential host to go after um it's through those those kind of physical characteristics so body odor temperature um sweat things like that some of them locate via color so like dark colors it will tend to like um entice mosquitoes to come over and then they'll kind of rely on those like chemical cues um so that kind of relates back to this like genetic association to bite susceptibility and then there's also thought to be a difference between whether males or females to, um, are more prone to getting bit versus others and they concluded that there's um a more intense itch response in females versus males um by a three to one ratio so females girls you're much more likely to get bit than than men um as if you needed one more thing to worry about right of course um and then it was also suggested by um 
a Hartford HealthCare's um, epidemiologist who, who said that um, type O blood might also be preferred for mosquitoes to come after. So there is that um, that uh, variable as well, whether you think you're more prone, like why you might hang out with your friends and go, oh, I always get bit by mosquitoes, but Sarah here never gets bit by them. Like there is a reason why. It's not just because of like the clothes you're wearing or just what you smell like. If there's like all these other variables as well. So typos are in demand by <laughs> by the blood banks and by the mosquitoes. That's interesting. <laughs> right? Oh God, which is Everyone terrifying. Because Oh my gosh. What if you get your typo, you get bit, you get a disease mm. and now you can't donate blood and help so many people because of your, you're like you have that disease and yeah that's that's kind of scary actually so be careful know what blood type you are know whether you uh like maybe get bit maybe get tested for something if you're in africa or something like that <laughs> so we can uh look at my notes and uh no no we're not we're not going to look at my notes those that's uh, oh, no. so, so so let's break it down to uh what is histamine uh, histamine is a chemical normally found in your body. It's part of the normal immune response. It's used for communication within the immune system. Uh, and when you overreact to it, we call those allergies or in severe cases, anaphylaxis. So, That's like when like your throat closes up? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So we tend to talk about just those two. Most people only know about allergic reaction and super allergic reaction, the anaphylactic shock they think of. Uh, so these are called hypersensitivity reactions and they come in four basic flavors. Your type one is your allergic reaction that you typically think of. It's called an IgE mediated hypersensitivity reaction. Big fancy term, we'll get into that. They're rapid, they come on real quick. Uh, and they're triggered by environmental allergens. So your mosquito bites, your cat's fur, you know, uh, oh, me. grass. <laughs> hay, so, probably. Hay, yeah. All uh, of these. What about like the food? Food, yeah. Anything okay, from okay. outside in, you're in uh, these, are, these are things that your body ah. overreacts to. And the process... Is basically so here we have a protein and a I wish I had labeled it this is a mast cell but it's it's part of your immune system so this is a cell okay. that is involved in the immune response the foreign invader comes in and binds to a surface protein called the immunoglobulin E or IgE it binds to them and that triggers this little ball of histamine this granule to go to the surface and degranulate and so this is ige mediated mast cell degranulation <laughs> some fancy words i know so okay so the protein is that the protein like like the the allergen yeah so in this case okay. I, I chose a protein uh to represent a, a, a protein that could be in the mosquito's saliva but it could be okay. it could be a lot of different things so basically this is the allergen yeah gotcha. so the allergen okay. triggers it and releases histamine that histamine goes in and goes down through the, the your immune response. This starts the process. Then you have your type okay. two hypersensitivity. Oh, was there something else? I think there was, uh, you had some comments on something. Uh, no, I was just um, about on the histamine slide, just um, wanted to chime in that uh, histamine itself is found in mosquito saliva. Yes. And that's what binds to histamine receptors that are in our body. And I think that's what the IgE is. Those are the receptors. And that's what triggers the degranulation. So uh, I, I wish I had put it here too, but later on I, I, do, I do touch on that. that um, so you can get the histamine either externally from the mosquito saliva and internally from your own histamine in a response to other things that could be floating around in the mosquito saliva. Oh, interesting. So it's actually, it's actually okay. both. Gotcha. Um, and then, so we won't talk about type three or four. They're not really relative to this, but there are two others. Type two is a tissue specific hypersensitive re reaction, Ugh. also known as cytotoxic or cell toxic. It kills mm -hmm. cells. <laughs> Um, these are your hemolytic anemias, hemolytic blood transfusion reactions. Again, you, you hear these words and it's like, I don't know what that is. And that's why people only think about the type one. 
Gotcha. But okay. in this scenario, I got this nice diagram that I wish I had put more notes on. The important <laughs> thing about this, if you taken a bio class, you might remember some of this. Something comes in, a foreign invader. The B cell yep. takes it with the help of a helper T cell. They process it and create antibodies via plasma cells. And then they create memory B cells, which is basically uh, stores a snapshot of this infection. So should that invader ever come back, they can quickly create more antibodies faster mm -hmm. than they did the first time. And that's why. You so this is this is like the basis of a vaccine, right? Yeah. Yeah. This is very this is similar. Like so, yeah, this is immunity. Does. This is okay. the immune uh, process. So all the. Uh, if you, <laughs> this is a big if, if any of you have ever um, looked into HIV AIDS, you might recognize the CD4 here. This is a uh, used as a biomarker for the progression of uh, the of HIV towards AIDS. This is just sort of an off topic mm -hmm. fun fact, but the interleukin four here is a it's a it's a communicator. This is going to be important in the next slide. So T helper cells, this, a lot of this stuff I had to like figure out myself too, because the, the research would refer to them suddenly as TH1 and TH2. And I had to go, oh, oh, T helper. Yeah. They never said yeah. from here on, we're going to call them TH1. Oh they just God. started saying it. And I'm like, oh, okay. This is why cell bio is hard. <laughs> yeah. they... And I just want to, to anyone in, in our audience, uh, don't feel bad if you don't know any of this. This is yes. not stuff that I'm very familiar with either. Uh, goal, this is like your field of expertise <laughs> is like cell bio, microbio kind of stuff. Yes. This this comes as a very big struggle for me. So if you guys have any questions about like any stupid sounding questions, feel free to ask them because yes, like please. this is learning for me as well. And uh, it, it's something that you really have to like train yourself to like become accustomed to and recognize like oh this is what they're talking about so don't don't worry if this is making no sense feel free to ask any clarifying questions yes i'm and i'm sorry yeah i meant to say i uh i'm trying to to not go off the rails with all of these crazy names and alphanumeric names and it is very hard and especially the further you go into these fields Oh yeah. the, the, you 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 become disconnected with the average person because it's like <laughs> this is now the things you talk about and you start talking to <laughs> you lose people so i will yeah. i will keep trying to rein myself in and please yeah ask questions so you you have two kinds of helper cells is from what i learned in this deep dive uh you have type one and type two type one promotes inflammation remember inflammation is good in the short term this is the normal response to invaders this is how your body protects itself but if inflammation goes on unchecked forever then you get damage and that's why mm -hmm. you need th2 which is going to counteract it and interleukin 10 they, they use that th1 another difference their cytokine their chemical messenger is interferon gamma th2 has a whole selection of them the important thing i'm i need to highlight here is that th2 promotes your ige response that type 1 allergic anaphylactic that one th2 is responsible for making that happen more and they here's one i had to go into another research article because they just said they just dropped this term eosinophilic responses and then they didn't say anything about what that was oh, That's terrible. i know <laughs> i know this is like so i like i know some things but then they just throw stuff out there and you go yeah okay sure i know nothing <laughs> yeah. so okay so how do, how they do this one of the things remember that interleukin 4 is involved in this so remember you have your two types of T helper cells. Th1 promotes inflammation. Th2 uh, provides checks and balances. It brings it back down to this sort of mm. steady state. Mosquito saliva, this is still being researched, but may actually modify the immune response and switch the balance towards this Th2-dominated scenario 
which then creates a delayed itch. So that was new. Okay. So here's where the update might, one of the updates might be, is that there may be an actual immune response change, a, a genetic modification, basically, uh, rather than just a, your normal allergic response. They didn't go into a lot of details, so I think that's mm -hmm. something that needs to be researched further. Yeah, that's really interesting, because I remember in the paper it talks about how there's like steps to people getting um, bit and reacting to a mosquito bite and how like sometimes like there's like different stages. So there's like that delayed react. There's like a small red spot to begin with and then the delayed reaction um, and then an immediate reaction later. Like there's. Yeah, people they were saying that there's maybe desensitization. After long term exposure, so you don't get that same response kind of like what you were saying um where like you kind of build up that like uh those like antibodies to keep you from having a, a right a reaction the next time it happens um but the fact that it's like shifting away from th1 towards th2 which tends to have the more severe reactions that sounds opposite yeah what paper says so it's a really interesting uh, thing that i think we need to research more yeah so to, <laughs> to sum up all of that stuff, mosquito bites can be, uh, mosquito bites cause itch either through histamine straight from the mosquito saliva or as a reaction to something in the mosquito saliva. So histamine that your body already has or cytokines, chemical messengers through that IgE independent, you did, 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 did that process. <laughs> So either cell degranulation, <laughs> <laughs> yada 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 yada, yeah, that whole thing. There's additionally tryptase and leukotrienes. That that's a whole different thing. It's not really relevant here, and that's too much information. So we're not even going to talk about that. <laughs> All right, uh, I have a quick question, and yes. I don't know if you know the the specific answer. But when you take an antihistamine, yes, on a cellular level, is it like? causing the opposite of like that degranulation to occur what with the oh, mast cells or do you know like what is actually happening when you take an antihistamine yes um ooh, man if you I don't it's okay i, I do know told you the, the, <laughs> the thing now we're getting into pharmacology uh, which is a okay. an awesome topic but it also i feel like i'd need to have a, a quick additional presentation on that the, the, no the process problem of what it does um yeah off the top of my head, I don't remember. I believe it's competitive binding for the H2 receptor sites. So again, it's like, bleh, 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 bleh. What, what are these words? Yeah. So basically, <laughs> Even I'm struggling. Yeah. So basically, you know, okay. So, you know, the histamine, the whole histamine reaction is the histamine comes in, binds to something and your body goes, ah. So yeah. if you can stop it from being able to bind to that site and creating a reaction in the first place, there's your antihistamine. I don't remember, but there's multiple processes. Sometimes it's because they block the site. Sometimes it's because they make the histamine itself not like the right shape to fit in the site, but that's getting into mm. nitty gritty. Essentially, they just stop the binding process is what an antihistamine does. So without- gotcha. So it doesn't trick, it like keeps yeah. the degranulation from even happening. Correct. It, it, the the oh. key will no longer go in the lock. Okay. But I'm wondering, like, I, it makes sense that, like, maybe before you know you're going to be, uh, like, have access to those allergens. Like, if you know you're going to a mosquito infested area, mm. that you, like, take an antihistamine to prevent it from happening. Mm. And I wonder how that differs from, okay, you've already had the allergen. It's already triggering response. Now I'm taking an antihistamine. And I'm wondering, I don't know if you know, but I'm wondering, like, how those two processes differ like one's preventing and one's kind of um reversing if that makes sense so you're, you're saying could you uh sort of prophylactically preemptively take an antihistamine if you think you're going to be getting bitten by mosquitoes and would it work well i mean technically yeah and people do it all the time like it, okay it's hay season gotta take allergy pills mm -hmm. every single day to prevent those that uh, trigger response so i'm just wondering how it how the prevention works versus where there's no allergen, there's no histamine anywhere. How is, does that work versus oh, if you were to okay, take the allergens uh, already here? 
Okay, so you're saying if you took an antihistamine, but you ha don't have anything to react to, does it change anything about the effectiveness of the medication should the histamine suddenly appear? Kind of. It's more like how how does, like, if there's no histamine there, like you have not had the tr the allergen yet, mm -hmm. and you take an, anti an antihistamine, how is it that the preemptive antihistamine, like, does the process just like prevent when the histamine does arrive like when you happen to get bit by a yes. mosquito does it just keep the the those barriers like locked yes so depending on well actually it doesn't depend on the exact mechanism so any medication has a certain sort of lifespan within your body and right. it depends on how it's it depends on the chemical makeup of the medication itself. You know, does it break down? And it depends on how well your body breaks it down. So, uh, yeah, any medication has a certain window that it exists in your body. So if the, if the antihistamine is still at a therapeutic and effective level in mm -hmm. your body, by the time the histamine does show up, then it'll, it'll work on that histamine. But yeah, if it's if you took it a week ago, it's probably not in your body anymore, and it's probably not. not. Anything. Yeah. Okay, so it's more like you take it, and there's kind of like a an extended amount of time that that histamine is going to work for. So then, once you do get that allergen, the and the histamine starts taking over, the antihistamine is like, oh, we see something, let's go do our job. Yeah. It's not like it's just like a one shot kind of, like you yeah, take it yeah. and it'll, then it it'll do its job as long as it's in your system. Okay interesting uh, okay so now that we kind of know how the itchiness works and like what's going on on a cellular cellular level uh, we'll talk about some prevention uh, clearly a lot of us don't like to be bit by mosquitoes some people it doesn't bother us but like even if it did bother me i would just be annoyed like i just wouldn't want mosquitoes around me especially knowing that they could like pass diseases and stuff like even if i wasn't like um sensitive to it like i just wouldn't want a mosquito around me because of those problems um so like i was saying limiting standing water is probably one of the best ways to to manage them um like i said before like because of like cavemen prehistoric eras where like we used to not do farming they weren't really mosquitoes that much to begin with um i know like <laughs> jurassic park has the whole like mosquito with dinosaur dna in the blood that was trapped in amber i don't know like how many mosquito species there were back in that era but uh they definitely i think had a, an explosive boom once standing water kind of came into play and that happened so i mean obviously there were lakes and, and ponds prior but uh with the invention of farming and like suitable hosts next to that water uh that definitely uh added to the severity so limiting standing water, also uh, populating that water with um, fish that prey on um, mosquito larvae, like that uh, mosquito fish that I was talking about, that can be very helpful. Tadpoles, again, dragonfly nymphs, things like that. Um, those are all good biologic controls to kind of maintain um, mosquito uh, populations. Um, and I imagine too, like it, once they reach their adult form of uh, things like birds, bats, spiders like spiders are an excellent biologic control not just for mosquitoes but for um ants earwigs um bed uh, bed bugs roaches like everything you find in your home um everyone here should know that i'm a big advocate of spiders in general so um super duper helpful to have around um physical barriers are also really important so if you think like a like a as a beekeeper you have like your bee suit and stuff same thing for mosquitoes um i love this photo because he's covered head to toe but his feet are completely like exposed like why is he wearing shoes <laughs> i don't know why he would do that if he's out in the wild um, so those things are can be super duper helpful, just like a mosquito net, like some people like have hanging over their beds, especially if you live in an area where there's um, um, like a lot of like developing countries where there's not like a uh, full sealed rooms or anything like that, or it's just very hot, um, moist environments tend to breed populations as well. 
Um, on the bottom right, this is the thing I uh, I think is very new and it is very exciting as well. This is a coat made out of uh, something called graphene, which is Ooh. like graphite from a pencil. So like graphite from a pencil is made with carbon. So this is graphene and it's made with a single layer of carbon atoms. And I, I should have added a photo, but it basically looks like a little hexagon kind of um beehive kind of pattern like that like anatomically like that's all it is it's just a layer of atoms and apparently this um layer sure for it or my comment um this layer of atoms can serve as a physical barrier to prevent mosquitoes from actually like puncturing through and like getting to the skin um and then it also can prevent um, the host from even attracting mosquitoes via locking in things like that odor, that sweat, that temperature, things like that, that might even entice a mosquito to come over to begin with. So I think that uh, capability is really cool and I'm intrigued to see like where it goes and like how beneficial it actually is. But I like the idea of like using like things you wouldn't expect to create products that are like long-term have really cool goals ec uh, ecologically. So having a jacket made out of a single layer of carbon atoms is really, really cool to me. Um, and then lastly, chemical repellents, of course, I think everyone has used them um, in the past or currently, even I use it, especially like going camping and hiking and things like that. Um, there's a lot of like, uh, skept not skepticism, but like concern about whether or not a, whether or not they're um, effective at uh, rejecting mosquitoes from coming over. Um, B, if they uh, like smell bad or if they're toxic to our skins uh, or to our skin. Um, or like if you're like a, a newborn or like a baby, like the top the, the chemical concerns with that. Um, and then being an aerosol and possibly like an insecticide if you're using those as well, just the effects it has on the environment. Um, so definitely do your research to see like which ones are, uh, I guess, least harmful. I think to, to an extent, a lot of them are gonna be harmful, but some are definitely more or less um, uh, harmful than others. And then the other thing I would say is uh, like um, more, uh, homeopathic things like essential oils or like citronella candles things like that um, which don't have nearly as many concerns um, of like toxicity compared to sprays um, but somewhat do the job i haven't seen too much personal um results with it but um uh, it's definitely a possibility so there's a lot of things you can do to prevent mosquitoes from like infesting your life um, or your family's life and um, kind of keep them under control so that's then it for my we got treatment uh it comes in two types usually but then uh the, the research mentioned this other avenue that may be available in the future so you've got your topical corticosteroids. These are just a corticosteroid. Don't worry about the cortical part. It's a steroid. What they do is they <laughs> modify the function of a cell. They increase anti-inflammatory proteins or stop the inflammatory protein production itself. Through either of those methods, you get less inflammation. Um, they come as there's two, two main uh types that you might see are hydrocortisone or clobetazone or clobetazol. Uh, these are a couple brand names. Uh, I'm not sure how often people use these. I think, I think, uh, being in a medical family, I'm more familiar with some of these medications that maybe other people just like, I don't even know what that is. I'm not going to touch that, but cortisone cream is used very commonly. And then I found this mm -hmm. one called Umovate, but these are the scientific names, the hydrocortisone, the clopetazone. Those are the, the generic names that you can find under different brand names. Next. You know, if, oh, uh, yeah. sorry, if you said it can increase anti-inflammatory proteins or stop the protein, the inflammatory, inflammatory protein production can, is there a medication that does both? That does both. Hmm. Yeah. Like increase the anti-inflammatory and also stop the inflammatory. 
like basically Off like the top of my head, time. I'm not sure if there's one that does both, okay. but what may be available is a combination medication. I think a lot of times mm. medications do do one thing really well. They don't tend. I, I I'm not familiar with a lot of medications that do multiple things or the science is not a, uh, is not available for whether they do or don't there's a lot of medications that we actually use and have been using for a long time that you look up the official documentation of what does this do and they say um it helps we don't know how but uh, we're no. going to keep using it as long as it's not hurting anyone and it's being good we like it so there you go. yeah there's a there's unfortunately um the 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 cellular level uh, of science is still a lot. There's a lot of mystery. Yeah. And, and again, there's so much variability in the pathways that these allergens can kind of take place and cause reactions. So like some medication is going to work for some people, some medi that same medication might not work for another person. So there's never like a foolproof. This will work. Like Ivy says that she puts vapor rub on hers Mm -hmm. nowadays and it tends to work better than pro with than creams and i think that's like crazy i feel like that would like burn especially because it's like an open wound like there's like so many like different things that work for some people that don't work for others so yeah in in a medical sense like it's i imagine it's uh frustrating not being able to say this will work for everybody yes yes and quickly on the vapor rub i would imagine okay i did not uh properly explain this so itchiness is sort of a subset of pain or as we called it in the science community nociception it's mm. it's a it's a nerve it's your nerves are angry <laughs> and whether it manifests as intense pain like oh i got a cut versus oh i'm annoyed there's an itch to it either of those mm. are basically noxious or negative stimulus it's a, it's a it's a message to your body that something's not right so yeah what you've got i assume in your vapor rub is menthol is the mint uh oh I think it's yeah oil. so that menthol in the same way that we treat uh, a backache you, you've got your icy hot or whatever so mm -hmm. menthol and uh capsaicin both cause basically so much noise to the cells that you stop paying attention to the Whoa. pain or the itch yeah so it's not really it's not getting rid of the cause but it is helping mask the symptoms and so it, it it's still an effective treatment as long as there's yeah. not an additional like disease process going on that's right the sort of palliative uh oh man see i keep throwing out these words uh as long as um soothing soothing mm. uh as long as there's not a disease that we're we're ignoring, just using soothing treatments is perfectly fine and letting the process take its course. Yeah. So then Yeah, for me, like like uh heat works well mm -hmm. for itchiness. Um and I think it probably does the same thing. That heat, like it not so it's so hot that it's like burning you, but it's A, it's helping with that inflammation in itself. And maybe that's the thing that's causing the itchiness as well. But for me, it at least that heat kind of just soothes everything. I think soothing is a really good descriptor. Oh, and they're saying that it also they they think it might also take the swelling down. That'd be an interesting. I'd have to look into that. I'm not sure, um, but for sure, um, in the immediate that that sort of masking of the itchiness is definitely going to help you uh, not feel uh, annoy, <laughs> not feel the itch. The yeah, other thing that's the worst to... thing for me is like itching feels so freaking good it does <laughs> and it's so bad <laughs> it's and that there's another you know that's that's a whole different topic that i'm not sure how much research there is but is that sort of like um is that an evolutionary adaptation to spreading the disease because when you itch oh. you make it worse you create this open sore could that spread uh -huh. the disease is that a good adaptation for the virus or is it just a side effect that you know virus doesn't care it didn't it's not stopping the process so yeah it doesn't matter if it kills the host i would think it's not quite evolutionary because it's not the virus like if like say take zika for example cycle. 
Well, not even that. It's not the virus that's causing the itch. It's the it's the histamine in the saliva of the mosquito. So I, th- I right. think if anything, it's more like a symbiotic, not symbiotic relationship, but it's just like kind of like a, a consequence, like a cause and effect <laughs> yeah. that uh, absolutely benefit would benefit the virus. Yeah, that's true. That does make a lot more sense. Yeah, it's just it's how things turned out. But uh, yeah, something you can take. Best uh that uh has been proven it, because we talked about histamine being a cause of the itchiness is an mm-hmm. antihistamine recommended though are second generation antihistamines so a lot of what people think of well they they only know as it's advertised to them they know benadryl and they know non-drowsy you know this is a drowsy uh allergy medication and this is a non-drowsy so first generation antihistamines are there's multiple but the one that most people think of is benadryl or diphenhydramine it comes in different names but diphenhydramine is the generic name the difference between that's a two, first generation yes that's called a first okay. generation um there's oh, okay. also now a third generation but oh, um, what the, heck? <laughs> uh, the the first generation the big difference between first and second is that the first generation passes the blood brain barrier and what that ends up causing is drowsiness the second generation Um. does not pass that barrier does not make you drowsy and so that will be your claritin allegra telfast or your loratadine your fexofenadine zyrtec Zyrtec. actually i could probably i have i still have a uh drug guide on my phone I wonder, just real quick, is Zyrtec, because why didn't I put it on here? Well, I take Zyrtec very occasionally, and I don't get drowsy. So I'm assuming it's not drowsy, but now I don't know. Sometimes, like, uh, again, with, with so much variability in, like, human bodies, some of these don't make people drowsy when they're supposed to, and vice versa, and sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. So there's never, like, a foolproof medication yeah. which is just yeah frustrating <laughs> i'm not finding it but that's okay <laughs> okay it is an antihistamine though it's an antihistamine um the third category that's uh it talked about it being a possible future treatment but it left it very vague there's not a lot of uh-huh. research on this it mentioned sort of briefly topical nerve pain medication and then didn't say much more so i kind of looked into that from what i understand nerve pain two main treatments are gabapentin and lidocaine gabapentin is often taken as a pill uh for things like uh, diabetic nerve pain or other chronic nerve pains uh it's a it's a very common drug and then lidocaine you may have heard uh if you've gone to the dentist and they've offered to numb you they might use lidocaine Mm -hmm. it's also used in other things that i I would be going into too much detail but it blocks or they both block or lower the nerve signal and create that numbing sensation i've never seen it sold as a topical treatment except for lidocaine mixed with aloe uh as a spray on treatment for sunburn uh you see yeah, it advertised as solar cane uh huh. and so that is a topical treatment so it is there is an i've just i've never heard of gabapentin being used topically but i found these images i think they they're either not available in north america uh Ooh. or maybe they're for animals <laughs> they might this might yeah, be or maybe they're like prescription only it could be this may be a future uh avenue uh of treatment it depends on how much more we learn about the mosquito itch being caused by nerve mediated as opposed to the inflammatory process right Ivy says that because they take uh, Lordadine, Lordadine, daily, Loratadine. There we go, Loratadine. Okay, yeah. Uh, that it doesn't impact bites that much. That makes a lot of sense because it's just Claritin. It's just an antihistamine. So if you take it daily, like you're never going to 
you're you're likely not going to get that mm-hmm. histamine reaction and that's what the immediate the type one reaction yes and that goes All back right, cool. to your earlier question of if you're always taking it but you don't have the histamine from the mosquito in you is it going to do anything well we've yeah. got some anecdotal evidence right there yeah the well but now i wonder like if you take it so often do you build up a resistance to to the medication the medication hmm i don't i've never heard of anyone building up a, an immunity to an antihistamine i assume it is in the realm of possibility okay <laughs> but it's probably very rare and then oh it's, i don't know if you, have you ever experienced so with mosquito bites now do mm-hmm. you get a bigger reaction than you used to than a couple Ooh, years ago that's a really good question i want to say yes because i and noticed that too yeah it could be a part years. really okay it could be me like I don't know. I feel like because I'm an adult now, like I don't have someone to be like, stop itching, stop itching, Alyssa, put some medication on. So like, I just, I, I'm my own worst enemy. So that could be it. Um, I even like, I've seen, like I have scars actually from mosquito bites that maybe was not a result from me itching so hard, but like, just like that bump, it's not even a bump. It's like almost like discoloration on my skin is still there. Um, And I don't think I ever had that growing up um but yeah I, in terms of like general like itchiness swelling redness i feel like those haven't gotten dramatically worse i think i'm just like i'm doing something about it whether it's a good thing or a bad thing <laughs> like i don't put a lot of medication on until it's been like two or three days and i'm like well, okay it's still bothering me because i'm itching like if i just ignored it it would go away within like a day but because i'm itching it and irritating it it sticks for like a week or two so um yeah i think i just have to be more mindful of that because i've noticed i at first i thought it was me i thought because this i started noticing it around the time i started getting my autoimmune uh symptoms and i thought Mm. oh maybe it's just me it's my body overreacting to everything including mosquito bites now but then I kind of looked into it and I saw there's actually a lot of people out there who recently have been getting really bit like, you know, it used to be the bite would just be what you typically expect of a mosquito bite. But I've had it yeah. where I got, I can't even see the bump. And there's an area like the size of a softball that's been oh my gosh. reddened or something. Yeah, it looks terrible. It's like, oh my God, what is that? Wow. Um, and I don't really know. I, I think the 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 jury's still out on that. Uh, is that a new strain of a virus, basically, that's going around causing it? Is it, uh-huh. you know, I don't know. I don't know why there's an increase in these reactions in people. These these giant reactions. And it's not yeah, like it's, I... it's not like it's going to send me to the hospital. It's never that. It just looks really bad. Yeah. Yeah. Ivy says, I feel like my welts are larger these days, but I also feel like the mosquitoes from my youth are different. Like now I see the teeny ones more, the tiny mosquitoes, you mean? Yeah, I was going to say, it. I think there's two possible explanations. Well, maybe three with your case with uh, autoimmune mm-hmm. diseases coming into play like that. I think it can absolutely have an effect. I think maybe, um, well, okay. Now I have like four possible explanations. <laughs> All right, let me start with the most, probably the most reasonable one is mosquitoes and their life cycle is so short that evolution in them can take place within our lifetime very, very easily. Like you can have so many generations of mosquitoes within, you know, 30, 40 years that it would make sense that they have evolved to have I don't know, higher doses of histamine or the saliva is just more um, infested with bacteria or whatever, or like the viruses are getting stronger. I think those are all possible explanations. My other theory, and I don't know if this is reaching, but I think it's very likely actually, is compared to when we were kids where we were outside so much more and getting bit and dealing with it and kind of building up that tolerance 
to nowadays where like we're inside so much more kids are inside so much more i wouldn't be surprised if that made a difference in uh us being more reactive to them mm-hmm. it's like you're almost like you you're you, you don't have access to to that allergen for your immune body to kind of work on and kind of keep it like in shape basically so when you are exposed to it it's a more severe reaction i don't know if that's I'm not sure. Or the, logical, the other one, but I think it's likely. The other one, like I'm hesitant to even suggest it because I don't I should preface that I am very much uh vaccinated. I am for vaccines. Mm-hmm. Uh there is research that is done, you know, there mm-hmm. and medication, yes, things can go wrong. That is un- yeah. that is an unfortunate truth of medicine that they don't say and no one I didn't want to accept when I was, you know, being told here are your treatment options for uh, your autoimmune disease. Mm-hmm. Medicine is cost benefit analysis, you know, uh, absolutely. But I also noticed like, OK, these bites came after getting vaccinated for COVID. And I wonder if you could do a study, if they could do a study on the unvaccinated population and the vaccinated population and reaction to mosquito bites before and after, and is there a significant dis- uh, difference? Dude, that'd be crazy. And it's so new. Like within just the last four years, that would, yeah. that would be a very interesting thing to find some sort of correlation to. And again, I think it's totally reasonable because it's all part of your immune system and the defense that you have. Like, yes, yes, a COVID vaccine is going to target the COVID virus, but it's still working your immune system. You're still building up a tolerance. You're still building up these TK cells. So like, like, yeah, it's, 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 it's it's a good question. It's like, I don't know. It's, it is something that is recent. So I don't know. Um, the good thing though, is that, like I said, it's not sending me to the hospital. So this isn't anything to worry about. It's just, uh, I like to learn things. I'd like to know why, why, why does this happen? My mom chimed in. I posted the link to my Facebook and she responded. I enjoyed your talk. I can't log into comment, but good job. Both of you. (laughs) Thank you. Yes. And. I but guess yeah, we'll leave it, we'll leave it on the on the kind words of Pyro's mom. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> thank you, everyone. All right. Thank you. Thanks for hanging out, everyone. Thanks for saying hi.